Hello, welcome and good evening. Welcome to Tarn Watch. Um, so we're here for the British Ecological Society um, Summer School for 16 to 18 year olds. So we're at the Malam Tarn Field Studies Centre and we have 31 students from seven uh, schools across the UK. Some have come from Jersey, um, the Isle of Wight, all over London. So we have a range of students who are all here together. So the purpose of this broadcast and the broadcast tomorrow night and the next night is to show you what those students are doing uh, during the day in the evening. We're working them quite hard and to share with you some of their stories and what they're learning about. Um, so one of the first things we started with was looking at what global challenges there were and getting students thinking about global challenges. So I'm joined with one of our students, Ray, who's going to um, tell us about some of the global challenges they came up with. So it was a really broad question, wasn't it? What do you think the global challenges are that um, we're facing today? Uh, so this was your, uh, the sort of a mind map, I suppose, of what you came up with, wasn't it? So we can cross to that now, which would be super. Um, so if we can make that happen, and we can see on your sheet. Do you want to zoom in on that little bit in the middle, shall we? Yeah, um, I came up with the ideas of um, uh, the largest global challenge that we are facing today as a society and peoples would be loss of biodiversity. And loss of biodiversity is caused by a, a number of things. And one of the main things that is caused by is habitat loss due to land use change. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest examples of this is in the tropical rainforest in Brazil, where we see tropical rainforests being cut down for cattle grazing, or tropical rainforests being cut, cut down for intensive soybean farming. Mm -hmm. And we also see that climate change is playing a large role in causing um, the loss of biodiversity, and the impacts are endless, and we don't even know the impact that loss of biodiversity causes, as it simply underpins the whole of the environment as we know it. And it also lays a foundation for agricultural production that is also productive and sustainable for us as peoples. So a lack of biodiversity puts our resources under threat from disease devastation and climate change, as uh, increased homogenization and reliance on a few crops such as rice, maize and wheat that we see in everyday society, whether it be our cereals in Western culture or rice dishes in the mm. East and Asia. We see that we're all eating the same amount of foods and our reliance on these crops and the lack of biodiversity are really, really bad mix. As when we lose biodiversity, these crops, will, if they disappear, we are left with a lot of people um, at risk of famine and at risk of malnutrition. And what we see now is that biodiversity is really important for the provision of biological resources. Mm -hmm. And that sustaining this environment and sustaining um, biodiversity is pretty much the number one thing that we must do as peoples. And it sort of links into my ideas about resource reliance mm -hmm. and about how, how about that we only have a number of resources in the world today and that how we're all reliant on a certain amount of resources. Um, with the UN and Climate Accord saying that biodiversity could make us lose about one million species in the next few years and that's a massive problem and it also links in, quickly before I leave you, uh, uh, economic inequality uh -huh. because economic inequality is so heavily linked to resources as they pretty much define how we are as peoples as uh, whether we're rich or poor or whether we have resources or how we don't. And that's why I believe that economic equality is also a massive impact that links into biodiversity and resource reliance as it simply underlines, uh, underlies the whole economic system and that the greater the disparity and social polarisation we see on a daily basis, the greater chance of civil and global unrest or economic collapse. So I'm getting the impression when you were coming up with the things that you think were the biggest global challenges facing you today that nothing was isolated there, all of these ideas were, were very closely linked, is that a fair comment? Yeah, I think uh, m many of my ideas are interdependent upon each other, so loss of biodiversity is very much interdependent upon res resources, and that loss of biodiversity is also interdependent upon land use changes and climate mm -hmm. change. Climate change isn't something that just happens, it happens for a reason, and, and one of the consequences of climate change is loss of biodiversity. Good time to study ecology. I think it's a great time to study ecology <laughs> and particularly physical geography or just mm. geography in general because I think it encompasses both the social sciences and of course ecology. Ecology mm. being the study of how we are influenced by the environment and how we influence the environment. Great, thank you very much for setting that up. So I think these global challenges are things that will underpin all of the things that uh, the students will be looking at this week. So they're going to be studying a range of different topics and skills um, that will all feed into a better understanding of ecology and um, 
how we can contribute to solving some of these global challenges. Um, so thank you very much for joining me, Ray. Um, now we're going to uh, learn a bit more about why we have uh, this summer school for 16 to 18 year olds from the British Ecological Society. So um, yesterday, Shazia and Jabeda interviewed the president of the British Ecological Society, um, Richard Budget. So we're going to play that interview now. So I'll just, uh, hmm. uh, sorry, I need to shrink that screen, click that button, and we're ready to go. We have Richard Bartlett here with us today, President of the British Ecological Society and Professor of Ecology at the University of Manchester. Hi Richard. Hello. Um, what were your goals behind setting up this program? Well I guess this, this program was really something that was very important for the society because we are very much of the view that the way to get people engaged in ecology is to inspire them from an early age, particularly when they're at school, get them out into the environment, etc. But this particular field course and programme is very much targeted at people who might not normally get that opportunity. And that's really what we wanted to do in this particular programme, is help people, give them an opportunity to get out in the environment, learn about ecology, witness ecology, because that's really what inspires people to want to go on to study ecology and actually use that ecology in useful ways in the environment. And having done a PhD yourself, what was your motivation behind doing that PhD? I think for me, I, I, I don't remember thinking of it as a career choice in the sense I didn't think, oh, it'll get me a particular job or anything. For me, it was really because I was just fascinated in the topic. So I went to university and did a first degree. Um, and I can still remember seeing the actual PhD on a board advertised. It was written down, it was on sheep grazing and how it impacts on soil organisms. And for some reason it just grabbed me and uh, I was really interested in the actual subject because it led on from what I was studying. So it was, it was really more because I, I was excited by the subject. And I went on to do that and uh, did, did very much enjoyed it. So you're now president of the British Ecological Society and that must have a lot of responsibilities. What kind of roles does the position entail? Well, it does, it does um, hold a lot of responsibility, and I feel very uh, honoured as an ecologist to, to have that role. Um, actually, my PhD supervisor, John Whittaker, was previously a president of the society, so it was really special to me to actually take on that role as well. In terms of responsibilities, they're, they're quite varied. I mean, ultimately, as the president, I chair a board of trustees, and the board of trustees, it's our, our responsibility to really sort of oversee the running of the society and make sure all the decisions that are made are in the best interests of promoting ecology and actually supporting the members of the society. And that involves lots of different types of roles. It involves chairing meetings and making decisions about how we prioritise the different activities because we, we do lots and lots of things. We work in policy, we work in education, we have journals where we publish science, we fund research. So it's thinking about how we prioritise the different roles. It also involves looking at new buildings. We have a new building. Um, we've just recently moved. It's not something I thought I would have been involved in, but we've had to sell one building and buy another building to house a society, which is happening at the moment. And it also involves meeting people, discussing with people, and, and, and trying to sort of support um, ecology in a wider sense. So it's, it's a very diverse role um, and a very enjoyable role. We also wanted to ask if you have any plans to expand the society further in the future? Well, at the moment, we are quite, quite a large society. We've got just under 7,000 members, um, and we have a whole range of different journals. And I guess our key priority is really to make sure they all work properly and that uh, we provide good services for our members. But we, we are um, keen to increase the membership um, of the society. Um, at the moment we've just released a new journal called People in Nature, a scientific journal. So we're sort of, we are expanding but we're trying to do it in a, in a controlled and uh, sensible way to make sure that we do best to promote ecology and support our members. And lastly, do you have any advice you'd offer to potential ecology students that want to study at a university but are worried about the career aspects? Well, I think ecology it is a discipline that can give you skills that can help in lots of different careers. The sort of traditional path, say when I was a student, would be to go into an academic career, and a lot of people do do that. 
Um, but there are increasing roles within environmental policy, for example, within conservation organisations, um, within lots of different organisations that are involved in different ecological, environmental aspects of the environment. And I think the thing I would say is that it's as I was talking about in my presentation, that, that there is a real need to actually change the way that we actually manage and actually protect the land, in that there are many different aspects of ecology that have been affected negatively by humans, and we really need to change the way we do that. And to do that, we need people who are trained in ecology, who have the skills to actually do that. But I think if I was encouraging anyone um, young to do a discipline, I would, I would do the disciplines that you enjoy. And if you enjoy what you do and you work hard, you generally do well. Thank you, Richard. It was a pleasure to have your time. Thank you very much. Fantastic. That was a brilliant interview from Shazia and Jabeda. So they were students last year on this program and then this year they're mentors. So um, while we have 31 students, we have a whole range of mentors here to help and support them to be available to ask questions. They're from a range of different careers and career stages. Um, and it's their role to sort of give information and to facilitate knowledge transfer um, between the students here. So it's great to see them returning for another year. So speaking of mentors, one of the mentors this year um, was Fran Scons, who's an entomologist, and she took some students out today to look at some entomology and some insect skills. So I'm joined by Hugo and Nell, who are going to talk to us about um, some of the insect collecting you did today. So we've got a little video, maybe you can tell us what's happening here. Hey, yeah, in this video I'm using a sweeper net to try and sort of collect <laughs> insects in the field. Um, this, I found, was the most effective way of collecting insects because of the biodiversity we have here. It is mainly a busy field and we tried to look in the trees but it wasn't quite as uh, diverse as we Was it a bit different? Did you use the same method in the trees or something different? Uh, we, used, we used beating with the trees to try and mm. shake sort of insects out but we found that there wasn't, because of the type of tree, there wasn't many insects at all. So our main source of collecting them was the field, which is really interesting. So we have another video that I think you took now, perhaps you can tell me what's happening in this one, if I hit play. Yeah, so what's in, that? <laughs> in this video he goes using a pooter where um, he, he like collects the mm -hmm. bugs that we caught in the uh, nets and it's a good way to like get up and close with the insects that we've caught and really analyse them closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really effective. So you're sort of sucking them into that little jar and collecting them together? Yeah. And collecting them from you too, I think. It, yeah, yeah, it <laughs> does end up swallowing a, a few bugs in the process. Brilliant. And so it's great to see you catching this um, on film and, and what you do. So, um, so then what happened next? Back to the lab and then can you tell me what's going on here? Yeah, at, the, at this point we're sort of looking at the insects that we've collated and found. And we're trying to figure out which species they are mm -hmm. by sort of going through these tables and seeing what sort of characteristics they have and narrowing down over a lot of questions and many pages sort of what sort of species we found. Yeah, so which was really interesting. So learning to use a key. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, really brilliant. Good. Never done that before and it was really interesting. Great. So this is an unusual photo. Is this one of yours? What's this? Uh, yeah, that's a. Well, what we first thought was a spider, but turns out it was a... It's a harvestman. Yeah. Even though it's got eight legs. Yeah, funny enough, because it has one body part, like, instead of two, like uh, normal spiders have. Mm -hmm. um, it differs. Yeah, it's, it's really it's interesting awesome. because the um, normal spiders have to create webs, and mm -hmm. sort of the extra part of the body they have helps do that, whereas the harvestmans don't have to do that, so it's sort of... Uh, way in which you can tell very easily that they're not a spider, which uh -huh. we initially thought, which was really eye-opening in yeah. this experience. Yeah, amazing. Uh, so we have one more photo from this. So this looks like Harvestman still. What's going on here? Yeah, we just used the keys we had um, at the lab and we found out it's a Mytopus morio male, which is a type of um, Harvestman. And yeah. Very interesting. Story. Amazing. So this morning you probably have collected insects before or never collected insects before? Yeah, this morning we had absolutely no experience with um, entomology, but by now we, we know a lot more than 
we already did and it was a really interesting opportunity. So you're using keys and even getting down to species for, for some things. Yeah. We, um, so it's so specific. A lot of other photos, how are you taking these pictures? Uh, well, we use uh, special lenses mm -hmm. which we can zoom right into and you can just put them on, on the back of your phone so it's quite handy to like, take around and you, yeah, you get very microscopic images of all the bugs and the details. Yeah, that's amazing. That makes it really accessible if you can just put yeah. this thing onto your phone. That's really brilliant. Um, Alright, so what was your favourite thing that you found today? Uh, definitely the Harvestman. Mm -hmm. That was the most interesting because we sort of narrowed it down so much and I originally had no idea and then after sort of a period of time we had such like a vast knowledge on the area that we originally had no experience with, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting. Great. Fantastic. And um, what did you enjoy most about doing this now? Uh, I liked a little bit. It was very interesting, but um, my favourite part was probably taking the photos of the mm -hmm. insects and like proper analysing um, all their like parts and everything. It was really interesting. It's quite eye-opening to see like how many different species there are in such a small area. Mm. It's really interesting. Yeah. Amazing. That's brilliant. So we have one more clip for you um, from this session. So one of the groups uh, put a time-lapse camera set up, set that up, and um, and so we're going to show you uh, how hard they're working over that long session. Um, uh, well, we changed guests. So thank you very much, Hugo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. So there's, oh, we had one more photo we forgot to get to. So I'm going to press play on this one, and that's great. Thank you. So here we can see they're doing all sorts of things. You can see tutors coming in and helping people moving between uh, microscopes and getting things in and out of jars, flicking through pages. I mean, they're really working another team. I think I can see Hugo and Nell in the background. So um, it's been a pretty busy day, starting from sort of 6.30 and things in the morning right through to 9. Um, but now I have another guest, my last guest for this evening. Um, is Cecilia Madupin. Um, so we have been uh, in the field today, so we literally uh, came in from the lab, had dinner and started this broadcast. So we're both still in our field clothes, feeling at our absolute mm -hmm. best. Um, so I'm very grateful for you for joining me today. Um, so Cecilia was running the last session on um, river health and freshwater invertebrates. So do you want to tell me a bit about what you did with the students this afternoon? Um, we had a bit of lecture. And then we went on site, did some kick sampling. It's good to get everyone in the stream, in the uh, Wellingtons, mm -hmm. you know, measuring, <laughs> taking the water quality, which is beautiful, and then sorting the organisms, and then identifying them. And then afterwards, after all the identification, the measurements, we came back and then we interpreted what the results were so that gave us an overview of what it is in other words starting the work from the cradle to the end so it gives us an assessment and um, it also helps us to be able to compare what the result is and how it matches with what the environment agency has and so it was good to be able to get the students speaking about why our results are not quite what they expected, that's number one. And number two, it was good for them to also be able to see how the samples measured in the morning slightly differed with what was measured in the afternoon. So there were a lot of explanations that could fit in, in those areas. Great. So two things that struck me about your teaching mm -hmm. was one, that you had a very specific aim and you were very clear that you wanted to have an aim, and two, that you brought both a kind of academic um, perspective but also sort of environment agency perspective. So those two things are very important to you in your teaching? Yes, actually. What happened? I deliberately, I deliberately, <laughs> I deliberately brought those aspects because mm -hmm. not many people have such opportunities. No. Because coming, I have a regulatory experience, mm -hmm. and I'm an academic, and I've worked in industry. Those are aspects that are quite integrated. 
and it's important for me to be able to expose that part of life to the forthcoming students so they see that it's not just about one thing mm -hmm. it's all about many things and you can do one thing at one point there are opportunities and prospects for the next level yes so it's, so it's very important because it brings in an applied mm. ex understanding yes i think that's great for me to hear so as an academic i sort of that's the career path i followed and i forget or i, mm. I just i don't have experience I, su I suppose that's a better way to say it, of how many other careers are uh, are available and mm. you're sort of a brilliant example <laughs> having been part of a lot of different um components of applied ecology, always ecology, but, um, yes, exactly. have, but um, mm. a range of different parts. So we have a bit of time left, so we can um, expand a little bit on what we did today. Um, what did you get the students to do? So they, they, you were looking at other things other than species identification? Uh, yes, you know, we looked at the water chemistry, mm -hmm. you know, so that because you can't explain the biodiversity completely without looking at the chemistry. Mm -hmm. And you can't also look at those aspects without looking at the catchment. Right. You know, what are the surrounding contributors? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you need, before an informed judgment is given to something, you must look at different aspects. So it's also strategic as well. Yes. Because <laughs> we could do without doing this aspect. But mm -hmm. I wanted the students to also see the various elements you can do stuff. Mm -hmm. And then to quickly know not only about the identification, there is also the data handling, you know, the data analysis, mm -hmm. and then the interpretation. Yes, of course. <laughs> Which, so, I mean, it, you can collect as much data as you like, but if you don't um, analyze it and, and then sort of present it, exactly. it, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I just give them a feel of what it is to do research. Mm -hmm. You have the aims, you have the objectives clearly stated, and you went out with what you needed, uh -huh. collected what you needed, yes. analyzed what you needed, <laughs> and then the next thing, you start interpreting mm -hmm. beautifully. And then when somebody asks you, what have you done? Mm -hmm. What did you do? How did you do it? Yes. <laughs> you know what to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think so. So do you, um, do you enjoy watching the students learn over the process? And, oh, it's and wonderful. It's wonderful to share stuff with them. You know, mm -hmm. we, I had a period in the session where we talked generic. Mm -hmm. As much as it looked and sounded generic, it was also an opportunity for the students to see beyond themselves, mm -hmm. see beyond their background, and see the opportunities that lie open. Yes, and I think bringing together students from, from all over the UK that was is a wonderful. perfect opportunity. <laughs> I, yes, I, I really enjoyed that conversation and I, I learned a lot too. Oh, um, so I think we have a couple of pictures that some of the students took. Um, maybe I'm, I'm a plant biologist, so I'm not really aware of what these are. What did they find today? Oh, well, they found quite a number of organisms that they found here. Mm -hmm. We're all related to organisms you will find in clean systems. But we found leeches. Ah. We found a very big leech. <laughs> Usually, leeches, you find them in systems that are not clean. Really? Yes. If you look, there is what they call the BMWP score, the Biological Monitoring Working Party score. Mm -hmm. So, in that one, you will see the score allocated to leeches, either the Glossophonidae or the Epopdilidae. Right. It's quite low. Oh, okay, so depending on what you find, get the you allocate the river system that talks about the river's health, and so the leech has pushed that down. Uh, but or... that is part of the story. Okay. But we had a lot of case caddis flies, mm -hmm. caseless caddis flies. Right. We had some mere flies that come under the good quality. Right. And then we have the mm. shrimps as well. Uh huh. So the shrimps comes under moderately polluted systems, you know. So if you have a boost of high sensitive organisms, mm -hmm. then it will push down the value of those that are either the worms, the meat lava, mm -hmm. or the leeches. Right. So, you know, that's the way things are. And actually, in a way, if we continue doing our sampling, we'll see that it matches with what the environment agency has. Brilliant. And so what, what can we see in this picture? Um, so I'm pretty impressed with some of the pictures the students, well, pretty much all of the pictures the students have come up with today. Uh -huh. What sorts of things can we see in here? Uh, you, we can see the shrimp, the freshwater shrimp. We can find... Uh, a snail? 
the that snail, is... yes. And then we can find a caseless caddis fly. Right, so that's one of the ones you were talking about, which is a good species or indicative mm, indicators, of, a, yes. of a healthy river. Mm. That's brilliant. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so uh, I wanted to just wrap up and talk a little bit about what else the students are doing today. So um, they started very early this morning with um, an option to go on a bird walk or a sort of a, a chilling out meditation walk. So the surprising number of students were up at 6.30 this morning. And we just had dinner and then we're going back in the classroom this afternoon. So there's several options this evening. So they're going to set up some mammal camera traps um, and look at catching moths and things like that. Um, and then tomorrow they're going to look at statistics, um, what else have I got on my list, peat bogs, talking about conservation and microbes. So it's a really diverse project um, over, the, over the five days that they're here, so it's, um, it's pretty intense. So this was episode one of, of Time Watch and then we'll be back tomorrow and the next night. So thank you very much for being a part of this evening. It was a pleasure, thanks. Um, and it was a pleasure to meet you as well. So oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, and we'll sign out tonight. Thank you very much.